Perfect. Okay. Hi, my name is Claudine, uh, pronoun she or hers, fifth year child development major, minor in ethnic studies, and I'm an intern for the MCC. Hi, my name is Natalie Zamora. I also use she, her, her pronouns. I'm a second year public health major and I'm an intern at the MCC. Hello, everyone. My name is Carla Espinosa. My pronouns are she, her, hers. I'm a second year child development major and I'm also an intern at the MCC. Hi, everyone. My name is Alexis Montgomery and I am an environmental sciences um, graduate student and my pronouns are she, her, hers, and I am a graduate assistant at the MCC. Great. I'm Kierimao Nanipa Roberto Monge. Buenos dias, me llamo Roberto Monge. Hello, my name is Roberto Monge, and it's a pleasure to be here. Um, I'm, uh, I'm from El Salvador. Um, I uh, grew up there until I was about eight years old in a small village that was. Um, uh, no running water, no electricity, you know, everything was, uh, you know, handmade and uh, we ran through the, the jungles and swam in the rivers and uh, kind of had a pretty, pretty neat life without really any uh, material or, or uh, even uh, monetary funds, let's say. Um, but um, I'm here to talk a little bit about uh, some of our traditions for uh, Dia de los Difuntos, Day of the Dead, there's plenty, there's lots of names for this time. Uh, and it's a, it's a pleasure to be here and thank you for having me. Okay, so, so to start off with our first question, we wanted to ask, um, what do you think are some fundamental pillars of the celebration? That's a great question. And I think, uh, you know, as, a, as you look at holidays, sometimes you see how that the, the core attributes sometimes are, are removed after a while. So in a way like Halloween coming up, right, is actually an example of that in a way. It kind of went from uh, All Saints Day, which the Catholic Church kind of used to um, uh, kind of, I guess, cover or take the energy that people would do for uh, Samhain, which is more of a Celtic holiday, and then sort of took it to uh, to different places. And um, so a lot of times the, the, the root, the indigenous sort of uh, part of that ceremony was forgotten in a lot of ways. And, you, you know, um, I think there's a lot of real great intent. And I think it, there is a lot about the beauty uh, in this holiday for me or this time for me. Um, but sometimes it's, it's, I guess, in modern times, it's been usurped in a way or that part has taken over and not as much into like the, the real heart of it, which is really just remembering our ancestors, our stories. And so, um, yeah, so for me, that, that's really the core thing. And I've set up a little, uh, we call it compostura. Some people call it ofrenda. Uh, here, uh, just an example. It's nothing to, you know, it's not a giant 40-foot floater. You know? <laughs> uh, it's really just, a, you know, a few pictures, a few items that really remind me of, of certain relatives and a place to really, and, and I would say prominently placed, in, you know, in the home in a way just to, to keep that reminder. Uh, in, you know, in El Salvador, basically work stops, and it's a kind of a four-day uh, long ceremony. In a way, it's to break you from your norm and really get back to that uh, reconnection and the storytelling. And I think it's also uh, a lot of times, let's say we have a parent that, that, that dies, and maybe there's a lot of unresolved <laughs> tension between them, right, between you and that parent it gives you a place and time to still like talk to them and still get to know them. So probably one of my favorite parts is a lot of my father's um, good friends who I just called tios. Um, I either call them up or I hound them and I say, I need a story for the year. And then they'll be like, ah, oh, you know, I'm busy, but hold on. And so in between classes, uh, a friend of his, Felix Cudi, would call me and it's, he teaches at San Francisco State and he'd call me, he's like, all right, I got one. Okay, listen to this. And it's sometimes this little tiny story, um, but it all, maybe it's like exactly what I needed in that moment. And maybe he wouldn't have told me that story earlier in my life. Maybe this is the right, right time for me to hear it, but it allows that continual um, connection. So so I think story is really the, the big part of it and keeping those stories alive. And maybe the second would be the foods. So a lot of times 
the uh, traditional foods and even non-traditional, right? If, if your relative liked macaroni and cheese and make macaroni and cheese. But if you know some of the, the older traditions and you can keep those going, and some of them take a lot of work. So uh, one of my father's favorite meal was tamales. And, uh, you know, traditionally they're hand ground and, you know, it takes a long time to wrap them. It takes a long time to cook them. It's a community effort. So at my celebration here, we would have um, people come the day before and like help us with the tamale making. And for me, that was actually one of my, like my favorite part, even over some of the more like ceremonial parts was just seeing the kids run around and grinding tamales and laughing with people and wrapping them. So, uh, so yeah, those foods that maybe take a little effort, but um, remind you of, of, of those who have gone before. Yeah, um, I'm Salvadorian too. So I definitely uh -huh. like the, making tamales is like always a holiday thing. So yes. I appreciate that we can even bring it to this holiday. Mm -hmm. um, and then, so our next question, you kind of touched upon it, um, talking about, you know, unresolved feelings that may come up, but how do you think your relationship specifically with death transformed once you started celebrating this holiday? Mm. Um, yeah, so, so I'd come when, it, when I was just eight um, and I don't remember too many, like I didn't go to too many funerals from eight till maybe 18. And I think that was just because that's the way, you know, here you don't invite kids to funerals. They don't, you know, keep them away from death. And I think in a way that's really bad because then when it does happen in your family or somewhere or a pet, then it, it's like a really, I mean, it's always going to be traumatic, but people don't know how to respond. They don't know what to do. Um, and so when my father passed, it just really struck me like, oh, I don't, really have a ceremony for him anymore and I started asking my tias and they were like oh you know we would all go to the to the um cementerio and we'd like clean up the graves and we'd paint them and make the foods and uh and it really and then I was struck with grief too because I said oh that's the cemeteries in Suchitoto, <laughs> you know a few uh, a few thousand miles away and um I thought to myself well you know, in a way, the the compostura or the or the the altar can provide a substitute. Now that we're all kind of wandering throughout the world, and none of our relatives are are in the same place anymore. And then I thought, you know, there's a lot of people that also have this problem that that live here. You know, that a lot of people that I know aren't from, you know, here this place. And so um, I invited some friends. You know, why don't you bring your uh, you know, your altar, your friend uh, to my house and um, let's do it together. Let's pretend we have relatives in the same place. And that really changed things. You know, it was no longer kind of a cool art thing. It was really personal. And um, we also, people that, let's say, weren't up to making a whole composition because it wasn't their tradition. We just had them write a, a name of a relative on a little piece of paper, and then we put it up on a tree. And then at one point I asked um, people like, one thing we don't do uh, with the dead anymore is really talk to them, like, like directly to their, you know, to their pronoun, to their name. And so I said, you know, let's, let's pretend they, they, they showed up because that's kind of our, what our tradition says, that, that they're, they're coming, they're here. And let's just talk to them. Like, and often they just want to hear gossip. They want to hear what's going on. You know, <laughs> did that lady ever get married? Or <laughs> and so um, I, we just everyone starts talking to the tree or the person that's named up there, and it's really interesting to see how people hesitate, and then like some people cry or some people laugh and tell a story about their kid playing soccer, and that little action changes it from like it's done and over to, oh, I can continue. And so that was this huge relief for me in terms of the um, relationship with death is that that it's something that, that I'm not gonna say confront, but it's something out in the open and we're gonna talk about it. And it's something that um, you do as a community and it's something that you can continue these relationships um, whether or not you believe that they're actually back or there's a, you know, if they're living somewhere else, it doesn't matter. It's really that 
ability to keep keep talking. Uh, I think that's that's important. I know you meant you were just talking about how uh, some ways that people could express this grief when they lose a loved one. But uh, a thought came to mind when you especially mentioned like children, like how would you approach explaining death to a child or maybe someone who is just experiencing their first death or someone who might not, yeah, have experienced death so closely before? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, that's, that's a great, great one. Um, I think partly being part of these traditions really helps in that they're not as connected to, let's say, my, you know, my grandmothers. Um, they weren't connected to them. So uh, every, you know, every deal of those we open up the old photo books <laughs> and we go through and pick them out. And it's funny, at first they were pretty, the kids were really funny. They were like, are they dead? Are they dead? <laughs> they were just like, you know, and then like, oh, tell me a story about that one then. And so, um, it was, it was just, again, the communication, being able to talk about it and that they're no longer here, but I have stories and, you know, I sat at their lap when I was little. And so it, it starts, I think that starts to set a little bit of an understanding. Um, I think the other one is really normalizing that, that getting together and, and grieving. Um, I remember um, a friend of mine, he was, um, he was Palestinian and his uncle was, was killed. He, he ran a grocery store and he got robbed and his uncle was killed. And it was amazing the, the response that his community, his family had. It was like everyone on high gear cooking food, you know, taking care of um, what was happening and, and kids are involved in making the food. And, um, it wasn't that separation and it really struck me that, that that's something that, that we're missing. Like we no longer know how to respond to death. And, and I would say the more we see it, the more we see healthy grieving, that, that the more ready we'll be for it when it comes. Um, and there's also a great uh, teaching that, that I learned from uh, Martin Prechtel. He's, a, he's uh, spent time in Guatemala uh, and, um, one of the, you know, one of the stories is that in order to, um, for the dead to make it to the, to the other world, that it, uh, they need our tears and they need our, our songs. And so in a way, you know, there, you, so much of, let's say, Western culture is like, hold it together. <laughs> Don't cry, you know, be, you know, have your poise, you know, but, you know, that that's not, a healthy thing and so knowing that your grief is really like a form of praise and that that's getting them across and so um look i made a song about how um the you know it's a boat made of tears that's propelled by our songs um just to get people to the other side just um you know that type of story and imagery i think also really help to to um you know, whether you believe it's true or not is, I don't think really matters. It's more just the imagery of, of someone needing your, your tears to, to move forward. So that's what I would do, tell them stories and have them involved in cooking or dancing or whatever it is. <laughs> I, I really appreciate the, the way you are like describing your experience with this. I feel like it's so beautiful and so very like, humbling to me and someone who's never really celebrated it as well or like um so like I'm very grateful for the way just even having this experience right now um mm. and then so going on to our next question sorry just a little sidetrack no, yeah. um but a little um I, my next question would be and I feel like you've touched upon this as well but um why do you think it's so important for people in this holiday, it's all about your remembrance and connecting to your ancestors. So why do you think that's like that connection to your ancestors is such a big um, and important part of this? Yeah, I think we're a very young culture, especially here in the United States. And there's a lot of really deep wisdom that's been forgotten. And you could say we're kind of paying the price <laughs> for some of that. Uh, you know, in El Salvador, um, uh, from the Lenca side, it's like 12,000 year old culture. You know, it's like ice age, um, Paleolithic drawings and caves. And so 
uh, you know, our people have been through a lot and a lot of the ways of, of uh, being are really like just technologies that have been tuned over time that allow us to survive, you know, this long. And so I think that that's one of the key things is really that, that, that searching for that connection. And then I, th I think it really does um, give us a sense of meaning. Also knowing that one day we're going to be, you know, an ancestor and like what stories are we leaving? What, you know, um, so one of the teachings too, is that if you don't l live a life where someone will cry, then you might not make it across. And then you sort of become this wandering kind of ghost uh, doing bad things because you, you know, there wasn't enough people there to grieve for you. So the idea too is when someone, let's say, is very loved and popular, then you also talk about the other person that wasn't so much to kind of help them both kind of move on. Uh, but I think it really, when you think about the ancestors and what they did and the examples maybe they set, it really is talking about us becoming that one day. And so, yeah, what's my story and what are, what are my kids or my you know, nieces and nephews going to tell about me when, when I'm gone? So that's, I think those are a couple important things. And maybe just to, you said you're from El Salvador and that maybe you didn't practice some of these things. And, and there's very good reason why that's so. You know, there's a, the Gran Matanza in 1932 where um, the Great Depression had hit, uh, coffee prices had dropped, and um, the, the owners of the land, we live in an oligarchy, really a post-colonial sort of phase, and uh, people were starving. And um, there was some uprisings that were led by indigenous people saying, we're gonna clear some of these coffee plantations and plant some food because we're dying. And uh, the oligarchy fought them and, and um, they sent in the military and killed like 30,000 people. And if you looked indigenous, if you spoke indigenous, if you did any of your traditions, you would be killed. And luckily some of our, um, you could say royal tier leaders in the Eastern El Salvador were not, were pretty far away and it's kind of hard to get to. And so they, their tradition survived in a way because they were so far, but a lot in near San Salvador and all the region lost all of its culture. Even my grandmother lived through that and she uh, like refused to mention that she was indigenous. Um, you know, they, got, they stopped wearing the traditional wipiles with the beautiful cloth, the woven cloth. They wore like just white um, gear that was a lot more like kind of like Spanish peasant uh, look. And even a lot of the things like we know, like Torito Pinto, uh, it was all more like a little bit more fabricated and more just let's bring in some of this, the, the Spain culture and have it re replace the indigenous culture because I guess we were a little bit troublesome in terms of like <laughs> not wanting to be slaves and and so remembering that also I think brings a lot of um, pride and it really reminds us how we're connected to the earth and so for me those are various reasons that that you know we they tried to snuff us <laughs> but we're still here so uh, and so, you know, keeping our traditions and our stories alive is really important because it took a lot of work to keep <laughs> keep them. Yes. Oh, Carla, did you have a comment? Yeah, so I actually had a question. Um, what would you recommend to people who have never celebrated um, the Day of the Dead and um, and that want to start? What would you recommend for them? Yeah, yeah. So, so a lot of people in my community had never, uh, you know, celebrated it. And so, um, I mean, I just asked them, hey, you know, pick a recent relative, <laughs> uh, find out what their favorite food was and spend a little time cooking and thinking about them. And then, um, yeah, have a little altar maybe with a picture of them and, and speak to them directly. Just tell them something you always wanted to tell them or... Uh, or actually also go and gather stories from, from other relatives or, or friends of theirs. And it's amazing how many stories people have that you had no idea and that really help explain either why they were so cool or why they were so uncool. <laughs> uh, but it, it um, just that simple act, it's not really that hard, right? It's more like investigative journalism <laughs> uh, is, is huge, you know, and, and, and 
you know, every year you can pick a different relative or, you know, go deeper into one, but it's, uh, yeah, I think that's a great, great place to start. And it doesn't take much, like, you know, a candle, a picture, maybe a little cloth or something, and, and you're, you're off in the race, <laughs> you're off in the race to uh, reconnect. Okay, that leads us to our next question. Uh, what are some misconceptions that you may have had about Dia de los Muertos and how have those shifted as you deepen your relationship to this tradition? Yeah, so in El Salvador, we call it Dia de los Difuntos. And I was kind of said to me, say, well, Dia de los Muertos is more like a, like a Mexican tradition, let's say. And, and it's got a little more, you know, you hear a lot of people say, oh, it's like obsession with death, you know. Um, and um, once I kind of dug a little deeper, that, that's just such a connection through the Americas, it's such a trade network of like kind of indigenous traditions that, you know, we really are all connected um, in, in our traditions. And, um, and it was, and that obsession with death, I think was more just the outside view of like a skull, like, oh, you would only think of a skull if you're like, want to scare someone, right? But it was more of an acceptance, like, look, we're going to turn into this. We're going to be a skull one day. And so I think that that for me was maybe the biggest um, misunderstanding of the of the tradition and, and some of the art is, uh, you know, it's not death obsessed, it's just acceptance of, uh, so yeah. Yeah, I think that's um that's a good way to put it. I had asked my grandma today. I was like, "Did you ever like celebrate this?" And I feel like just understanding like how El Salvador um celebrates it and like their tradition and the difference it is in like I guess the um mainstream media or Mexican culture. Like I feel like you can tell there's a connection, but there's differences, and like those differences are so valuable still. Mm -hmm. um, so that that was interesting when I even talked to her about it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I think a, a, a good part of we, we have ours a little more down, dumbed down or, or like um, less flashy, let's say. And I think it's because of that, that um, the, the great killing in 1932, because um, that really made everything kind of go underground. And I think uh, lots of parts of Mexico were still kind of uh, allowed or that, you know, that didn't happen there. And so they continued with the more um, vibrant, let's say. But there's a lot of regions in El Salvador where you'll see a lot more of the, the, the big colors and the big celebrations. Um, but pretty much everyone goes to the grave sites and, and tells stories. Um, yeah, yeah, I definitely that's a thing she mentioned when I asked mm -hmm. her about it. Yeah. Um, and, and then going to our next question, you kind of talked about your relationship and how it evolves with um, Dia de los Muertos or Dia de los Desfuntos. Um, so how do you see, like in the future, how do you see this tradition in general just evolving? Yeah. Uh, it's, you know, it's... Um, I'm hoping <laughs> that like my children will, will keep it going. Um, they kind of prefer it now to Halloween, even though, you know, the candy is really tempting. <laughs> uh, and I've noticed that that people in my community who have been coming to here, there's actually one, um, uh, a friend of mine, her, her and her husband had come one year. And then uh, in a couple of years, he passed away. And so um, she brought it to my attention. She's like, oh, wow, um, David's the first person to kind of be part of this tradition and then sort of be on the altar, you know? Um, and it really, I think, struck to her that, that she wanted to keep doing this because she wants to imagine people doing this when she's gone. And so um, it, it, I guess it gave me hope that, that so many people have been so receptive to it and, seen the importance of, of doing this. So yeah, so I hope people continue. And, and uh, like I said, it's not, it's not too difficult. And um, I think it, it provides a huge, for me, it's, it's, like I said, one of my favorite 
uh, times and, and even just the, the foods, right, and working together. And uh, yeah, it feels like a village day. I had some pictures if you want me to go through some, if that's of interest. Yeah. yeah go ahead. Yeah, we would love to see it. Okay. Let's see. Bring up some photos here. Okay. Can you guys see? Okay. So that yeah, this is in um, in uh, Suchitoto, and um, it's what I mentioned that people go and and sort of beautify the place and you know sit and tell stories and one of the I guess aha moments that hit me was I was I was in Suchitoto the year after my father passed and I was called to come back to the Los Muertos there and um, I'm sitting on the grave site where like my great great grandfather and like everyone sprinkled nearby and even my my father's grave has like four layers deep <laughs> and there's different people just because there's not enough room to <laughs> to have like a, a little plot for each so when they buried my father they actually took my grandmother's bones and put them at the foot of uh of his feet and i said is that something that's commonly done they said yeah it's kind of represents that she birthed them and now they're kind of together again and i was like wow okay uh but it was strange to see her bones being moved <laughs> um but uh, it, for me, it's just beautiful that there's just these stacked layers of, of people and relatives. And, and I'm sitting there and this older gentleman comes by and he says, he's like, who are you here for? Like he didn't recognize me. And so I said, oh, I'm here for Alfredo Monge. And he's like, oh, yes. He's like, he's like, I knew Alfredo. And he starts to tell me the story. And I was just kind of flabbergasted. Here's, you know, I hadn't been there in 35 years. You know, my father hadn't been there that long too. And here's someone bringing me a story that was just just beautiful. And it's what really awoken me to like, oh, they do visit if, you, if you're in, in this place or if you open up this, um, this time and, and place for it. And so then I kept like, going around going, hey, do you know a story? Can you tell me a story? Uh, but yeah, that, 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 um, I don't know, it, it really was, was a magical moment for me to, to have that happen. Um, let me see. 